president for 11 years. He's an internationally recognized scholar in the field of electromagnetics and one of the most well-known engineering and science educators. David will address China's effort in globalizing its higher education system from a historical perspective and the challenges it faces in education reform, as well as its innovative, innovative, innovative advances in international collaboration. Uh, I want to say a few seconds, uh, since uh, we're giving the mandate to finish uh, our remarks in five minutes. I have to tell you that uh, when we first talked, Cameron and I, we were talking about three minutes, but he knew that uh, he couldn't quite hold it all these professors uh, <laughs> and, uh, not talking. But he didn't know that he need to refrain uh, Kai Fu Li. <laughs> <laughs> anyway, I want to make a few points. Uh, the first part is uh, basically uh, the historical perspective and the challenges that I see. Uh, I've been going to China, particularly uh, universities uh, in the last uh, maybe six to ten years. Each year we'll probably make uh, two or three visits. So uh, my, my context, I have to kind of preface saying, uh, mainly these top 100 universities uh, in that, uh, that I have contact with, so it's limited. Having said that, I think the few points I want to make in terms of perspective is, one, uh, China in terms of the history in building its modern educational system is rather short. If you think of uh, how they started with uh, uh, the Russian style and then the Cultural Revolution that put everything off, and then later with the financial burden of funding these universities, at the end of the day, I would say the, uh, the history of building, seriously building, a higher education system is probably the last 10, 15 years, just like what we're referring to, uh, like uh, the Premier League, Vice Premier League. The second point I want to make is uh, the enrollment, in, in fact, has grown quite a bit by, in some way, if you look at uh, the, what they achieved in the last two decades, they still have uh, some way to go. Now, uh, I will tell you some of the statistics that are actually more recent. Mine was, dig I digged uh, out those statistics from the uh, Department of Education. But surprise, surprise, the, earth, the most recent data they have is 2002 and 2003. So he would quote uh, 20 some million, for instance, and I only have 9 million uh, uh, in terms of college uh, uh, enrollment. But here lies how fast it is. Okay, I mean, that's a fact that, that they didn't publish more recent data. And if you look at these two data, it tells a really good story about how fast they expand. Um, but they do have a somewhat of a, uh, a catch-up to do, particularly in rural country. If you look at uh, the cohort of college student, age students going into college, uh, the college age population, it's still the, back in '02, it's still like 15 percent. So no matter how fast this number is growing, by comparison to the developed country, there is still some way to go. The third point I want to make is that. Um, the reform of the higher education, in fact, is burdened by some limiting factors, some actually cultural, some structural. And I'll make a, a, some few, a few points there. Um, one is the cultural revolution. As a result of cultural revolution, they basically skipped at least one generation of academic leadership. Uh, so, not until recently, you don't see you know, the people in the 50s, for instance, you don't see that many uh, real strong academic leaders all above. And now you start to see the 40s and 50s, uh, young, uh, early 50s and that kind of uh, leaders coming up. Uh, the second point is the university financing, I find this uh, intriguing in that uh, as, as much as they have improved the, the, the support of universities, China Universities feel presidents are harder, their jobs are harder than ours in that there is still this mindset of crater, crater to grave, that you need to take care of me uh, and my father and my kids. And, that there is, and the retired faculty and staff is actually creating a big burden 
for many universities that I know. Uh, faculty, on the other hand, uh, any university, by the way, coming out of the 90s, the university became a lot more uh, entrepreneurial. But as a result of that, often you wonder why are they doing things that are not really germane to their core mission. And uh, you talk about the, the fellow you met uh, as a long list of colleges. I met one school in Sichuan, uh, I should, should be nameless, that actually started a, a public school or town can start in conjunction with private capitals, can start independent colleges. This one state university has over 20 uh, private colleges. And so that's uh, the university has to run into some of these burdens. Uh, faculties are very, almost uh, overly entrepreneurial. They do have uh, outside incomes. And in fact, Professor Cho probably could come comment. Uh, or I call it really Yao, it's uh, the English translation. Uh, uh, Yao is telling me that, uh, in fact, it's confirmed. Uh, faculty can take more than 100% uh, salary. You could get the two jobs uh, if you need to, a two full time job if you want to. So there are some things like that. Uh, the ministry and, and government in general, they really do encourage innovation and reform, in my mind. Uh, but they sometimes have harder time to manage it. Uh, I can give you examples later. Uh, I'll skip the examples and, until we get to the uh, Q&A. But they, there are some really uh, very, uh, uh, I would say, revolutional concepts are being introduced. Not lesser is the allowance of private colleges. Uh, it's, but still, there are a lot of uh, problems in terms of management. Despite all these constraints, though, I would argue that uh, the global life in Chinese universities uh, is really happening faster than most of the countries that I know in the world. And, and there I like to sort of contribute a few uh, points. I will just read those points because I think time will be quickly running out. Uh, one is that even though the foreign students in, in China, China is still very small, Yet, the awareness, the, the global awareness on Chinese campuses is very strong. Um, we know why. Uh, obviously, there are a lot of Chinese students coming uh, to uh, study abroad. We know there are a lot of Chinese students not returning, therefore creating a large uh, inventory of experts overseas. We know because uh, people like us, the overseas Chinese, uh, the Chinese Americans going back to, to help, we know the multinationals is helping uh, in a very big way in these ma major university campuses. Uh, back again, the statistic in 2003 is $300 million U.S. a, a year if you aggregate all the university, uh, the, the support the university gets from the, youth, uh, the multinationals. But I suspect the number is much bigger. Uh, so there are on and on the reasons why they are actually in good shape. Uh, now let's get into sort of what are the new models that I see in the last few years. And this almost like their statistics. Every you go there, you find a new model, yet another new innovative thing. So it is actually quite, quite uh, exciting there. Uh, on the academic side, let me uh, and draw some of the research side because I know Professor Yao may have one more to say on the research side. Uh, uh, on the academic side, uh, I would say, argue that there are all practically hundreds of the so-called two plus two. The two plus two is that they educate the students for two years, and then the students would be transferred uh, to some uh, uh, university overseas. Uh, and ca Canada, for instance, just one uh, university I know in Sichuan actually uh, has a consortium of 10 Canadian universities that have this agreement to send the students out after two years transfer to Canadian <coughs> universities. A little more innovative and less, therefore, somewhat rare is the so-called one-to-one one -to -one program where the students, on the regular students, spend their second year and third year in the four-year bachelor degree. Uh, I, I'm getting there. Uh, that uh, that uh, sending the bachelor degree overseas for two years, but they have to go back there the last year in order to get two degrees. And you'll find the dual degree programs not only a bachelor's degree level, but also a master level, 
mass and degree level one plus one, 